here we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Carla Uarte. 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 It's honestly, no one can say my last name but me and probably like my family and stuff, but it's a very difficult one. Carla Uarte. Oh, wow. Correct me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I w wanted to speak to you because we have often crossed paths socially and had little moments of touching on what we both work on, but I've always been fascinated to find out what you work on, considering that you and I have come from similar backgrounds in terms of ad agency world. Right. And I really love to hear about anyone's emancipation <laughs> from ad agency world. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, look, the easiest way that I can start any conversation like this is by saying, when someone says to you, hey, what do you do? Mm -hmm. What do you tell them? Well, it took me a while to actually get to this point. Um, I was, for some reason, in a casting with my ex-boyfriend, and I'm not an actress or do anything. I just went with him because I had nothing to do. And she asked me, she was like, what do you do? And I just told her, like, I paint. And she's like, what's wrong with you? You're an artist. Just say it. And then something clicked, and I was like, what's wrong with saying that? You know, a lot of people look at it as a pretentious thing, but I think it's actually beautiful to celebrate what you, you know, if you are an artist, and, and I don't think it's a taboo word, so I say I'm an artist. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, we should be so lucky that there are more people who stand in that and, you know, look for all the ways in which being an artist can have meaning and offering. Mm -hmm. And so what, what are the outputs and the formats of the work that you do currently? Well, it kind of varies from painting to writing to video and generally I think it's just creation. Because I think every time I check in with you, usually the format's always evolving. So mm -hmm. There's usually different ways in which you seem to be working. In the last, in the most recent uh, past, when you have invested energy in in projects, what do they look like? Well, it's interesting because it's not clearly one thing. Um, especially now, I'm working more in like a curatorial role um, for Down Under, and where I'm kind of working with other artists to create a body of work together and showcase that. So, what's Down Under? Down Under is a gallery, an experimental space um, located underneath Frida's Great. that I've started to run. And for those that don't know, because we have guests um, from all around the world yes. who listen to this podcast, That's true. Uh, what is Frida's? Frida's is um, Sydney's number one party bar. <laughs> Frida's 2016. Is, Frida's is actually Sydney's number one party bar to me always yes because it's the only place that you can go where you can hear great music every night of the week mm -hmm. i think they're open every night of the week we are not open every night of the week Tell but you, what you, what, we what we go open? we go, it's a new schedule actually we go, we're going wednesday to sundays okay. now because the mondays and tuesdays people got to rest guys like <laughs> this is it's a, it's a, it's yeah. a we've imposed days we're in of rest. we're in sydney by the way where people like to rest so <laughs> <laughs> We're in Sydney where, don't even get me started, yeah. there is no nightlife, there is no social culture mm -hmm. to speak of, so when a bastion of hope and music comes along like Frida's, you just respect it and celebrate it. Exactly. And, so, and also Frida's does a wonderful job of, of being more than just a bar, like with Down Under, so yeah. tell me how long Down Under has been going for and what's happened since it's opened. Well, it's actually been going on for over a little over a year um, there were a couple other a year or two um, correct me if I'm wrong um, and there were two other curators before me and I guess their visions weren't really aligned with with Dave who owns the space and so it was really difficult for him to um, kind of I don't know, make that whole thing work smoothly with his vision and work with the curators and blah, 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 blah. And then finally, I kind of jumped on board in a really organic way. Um, and it just kind of clicked with us, um, our working relationship, and we had the same vision. And I think when you do have a space and you don't have enough time to like 
go over everything and run everything and do everything because he's also managing the bar and you know taking care of the whole business and to have to work with someone who just gets it and so you don't need to be across every single thing you know um, that's kind of what happened with him and I and and ever since I jumped on we did a call out because a lot of things in Sydney we feel like are kind of happen within bubbles and so our idea for the space was to have this art experimental space and we wanted to give it rent free for young emerging artists to give them a voice to not take commissions and to just let them have this space and then to have the opportunity to celebrate their artwork and throw an after party you know so it's kind of a multi-faceted faceted event um, which and is it's cool. quite resourceful too because that space a less imaginative person would have just used it as a storage space or you know it's right. just a, but it's a now that the walls are all white and it's just cement floors, it just it, it is the perfect gallery. Yeah. So you may as well integrate that part of the creative community into the bar because they're going to be bringing wonderful people into exactly. the space. Exactly. And yeah, and since we've had um, about four shows already, two of them that Dave and I curated together, um, and they've all been a huge success in the sense that, you know, going into an event like the events we've had in the past, it's like you feel this feeling of warmth and of openness and of people wanting to engage with each other, not this kind of like cold exhibition thing. It's like a party and it goes on till 12 and it starts at six and no one wants to leave and everyone's talking and chatting. And even from doing that, we've met other people who, who, who are like gonna do exhibitions in the future just from that social engagement. So it's opening our doors to the entire community and creating our own community within that. Well, that's the thing as well, because a lot of people have spaces that they just don't know what to do with. And then the flip side is there are lots of people who are, oh, if only I just had a space, mm -hmm. you know? So, so rarely do the, those two forces meet where you can have people making, you know, opportunity out of possibility where, you know, because if you're a creative person, chances are you're just dying for somewhere to do your thing. Oh my God. Whether that be a band to play, a, an artist to show work, a, p actors to stage, community theatre, you know, creatives need spaces. Yes. And actually I would say this to anyone who's listening who has the possible like who has a space or has the possibility around a space, you're sitting on, you know, a cultural gold mine of what can potentially be offered for people to do things at, you know Exactly. Low cost, no cost. If there's a benefit, like for example, in terms of the bar you can see what the immediate payoff is. You might not be charging people for the gallery space, but then people, how are, buying people drinks are buying drinks. And, how, and you're creating a culture around your bar and people are knowing about your bar that don't even know that it existed before. And so, yeah, I think that people who do have a space that they could give out to young emerging artists, that they should think about what they will get in return. Not, you know, not just m money or whatever, but like the other kind of costs that fill you up from and, it. And even if you're not capable of operating a space, finding that, you know, plucky 20-something uni student who's into the idea of managing a space or, you know, finding that middle person to run it for yes. you is actually a great way to do nothing but, I'll, but then get some of that benefit without anything more than just a screening process to find your curator or your, yeah. your space. The person who's running the space, which you know, oftentimes, you know, my uh, boyfriend Paul has come from a fine art background, and his biggest grievance with the art world was the the kind of monopoly over opportunity that gallery owners seem yeah, to have. Yeah, it's it's really crazy, and it, it's like something that is so precious, or organic, and natural turns into this weird, dark thing, and you're like, what the hell? That's not what I, you know, that's so against my vision. And, and it's just kind of like that. The art world is, is very weird and crazy. And I'm still trying to figure out, but I don't want to know too much about it because I still want to just keep my naivety, naivety, if that's a word. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, in, in the, in the fore, foreground of my, of my life, I think that that's important. Well, just to, to backtrack about where you've, been in the lead up to getting to this place that you are growing an art practice and also playing in a you know practical and commercial space within an art space and uh, mentality 
if I had checked in, <laughs> how far back would I have needed to go to oh. find you in, right. an, in an advertising space? Right, so I moved... Poor, PS, poor advertising, I mean... We don't hate you. As an industry, you've given me so much. You continue to give me so much. Far be it from me to bite the hand that continues to feed me. But I just, the only reason why I'm particularly harsh on you is because I love you. Yeah. And I know that I was once that creative person who was pushed into being part of the advertising world because my parents didn't know what else to do with their creative kid. So therefore they were like, well, what's the best income we can foreseeably <laughs> allow you to have? Advertising. You creative, you That's go so work funny. in advertising. And I think like many people who stick around much longer than I did, um, you can end up being a bit disillusioned by the fact that you entered this thing thinking it was going to be something that it wasn't. Maybe the payoff was, oh, I get to be a creative and earn money and then after a while you get sort of further and further distanced from what you really came to it for in the first place. Yeah. And it's just the money that's keeping you there. Am I just projecting my own really, my own No, there's a lot of sad, I was surrounded by a lot of sad ex-artists. Yeah. And I was freaked out. I was like, oh my God, no, no, no. Um, so just to answer your question before I get deep into it, um, I graduated, I moved from Spain to Sydney um, to go to design school because my mother lives here and she was like, either you're coming or I'm buying a house. Like, what do you, you know, this is your last chance. And I was like, okay, I'm coming, mom. I was 20, 22. And I was like, okay, I'll stop my partying days. And I, and I moved and I went to um, study graphic illustration and design. And I graduated. And my friend, who's um, the executive producer at Heckler, um, Bonnie Law, uh, she was like, there's an opening here. You just graduated, front of house. And I was like, yes. Like, and I went for the interview. I got the job. And I started off front of house. and. I was like, wow, this is pretty wild. Because I, I was just interested in understanding how an agency ran. A very good thing for anyone who wants to exist in a creative commercial space but doesn't know where to begin mm -hmm. is to do a role like front of house mm -hmm. where you're sort of everything to everyone. Exactly. And you get a chance to see the workings of the machine from inside the machine. Exactly. And you mainly, what I really needed is like these organization skills, you know, iCal and just understanding how to stay on top of stuff and meet deadlines and that kind of thing. It, it was really beneficial for me because I was a mess. It was, you know, I was a crazy art. I was like, Duh, I had no patience. And so I was like absorbing all of these things that I needed. But it was also, um, I was also really bored. I was like, okay. And so I decided to run my own internship program within the company right. and I had about like three to four interns at one time and I would make them do everything I didn't want to do and <laughs> make them get the coffee and the food and then so I would you're, just so to the people above you you look like you're super onto it and like, I was you know, just I had my, your own program. yeah I had my own program and I was just having a ball and um uh I was uh, really good friends with these guys who had this um record company called multi Culti record label and I was like you guys need music videos and my interns are studying like Final Cut Pro and Premiere Pro and I need them to learn something because I can't just like use them for their bodies and make them do the things I don't want to do I want them to actually get something so I would come up with these projects where I would get these music videos from these artists and I would um, collaborate with the interns and learn from the interns how to get into you know use these programs that I didn't really learn at school and so I was learning from the interns and I was teaching them and I was I started my whole stop-motion animation kind of artistic route from that and then we would produce a video and the artist would come into the office and I would call everyone in the um, in the meeting room and we would show them all what we did and it was really fun and I really liked the freedom that I had in that job and I feel really grateful for it. It was, you know, I didn't even wear shoes. Like sometimes I just didn't have shoes on and I would walk around and <laughs> I was a crazy animal in this like corporate, you know, area. And, and it also needs to be said that Heckler is a perfect example of a great little, well, was, was once little, now is a medium to large size yeah. company where it was started by, by 
a small handful of, of cr creative entrepreneurs, probably in response to things that they didn't like about exactly. the industry. And I think that that, is, that exists. So, I mean, when I say make, make fun of like, you know, the advertising industry <laughs> as being something that I no longer want to solely exist in, I think I exist currently on the periphery of within my own content creation space. But, you know, I definitely am thumbing my nose at like big, gigantic, mega yes. corporate advertising. Totally. That's, that's the, the dinosaur that is currently growing extinct, like that version of advertising. But there are a lot of really great little agencies that yeah. do Heckler's uh, a special effects company that then became a creative yeah. agency that just sort of grew to respond to the, the needs of its clients in an organic sort of way. So it yeah. feels like people who are working there are, are, seem to love it and have a really great positive experience. Yeah, I it. mean, totally. I just didn't like, I just hate small talk. And I didn't like having to talk to people in the kitchen and talk about my weekend and the same questions all the time. And I was not good at hiding that. And so I was just this grumpy girl at times. And I was just like, oh, I can't can you ask me something else and I would say that and you know I'm just uh, kind of now that I'm older learning now how to deal with what life is um, but I just had a lot of trouble keeping the normalcy of you know how you need to be in a professional environment well that in itself fascinates me because everyone finds themselves in versions of that where they're yeah. expected to play along with this learned way of being that doesn't feel very natural mm -hmm. therefore if you are someone that questions life and existence at the best of times when you're <laughs> faced with really boring small talk of course you're going to push back on it yeah. so what is the answer to that is the answer to, to like tap into the truth of the situation and say this is small talk let's go beyond that hey what was the last thing that really blew your mind creatively or you know something to cut through the bullshit if you have the energy or interest in really talking to someone and you want to do that with your time and you don't like small talk then sure you know but i i just like i didn't even want to have a i was just like i don't want to talk to you i just want to like some I'm, I'm a cancer so i i'm very much like need to be in my shell and then when i'm out like i'm out but when i'm in i'm just like eh. but when you have a you know nine to five job that you have to go to every day and you're in your shell you're just like you're stuck um, so I was like, I knew in the back of my mind, like, I need to work for myself. And this Which isn't... Which is the truth for some people. Yeah. And this isn't like, I can't do this. It's just, it doesn't make me happy. I don't like, I don't like forcing myself to socialize when I don't want to. And I don't know why I need to. You know, that's not what I'm getting paid for, but it is. Um, so I just knew, I was like, that's gonna, that's gonna need to change. And I'm gonna have to figure out how I can, you know, just work for myself or, you know, figure something out or work with people who we can just be silent or whatever but um yeah <laughs> the, the, the key to my sanity <laughs> in, within my own workspace was and I think it's allowed me to level up quite considerably is realizing all that really matters to me is being able to control my environment mm -hmm. when I say control hopefully not in an OCD way although I'm prone to it but <laughs> in a way that allows me to go I know that if I'm throwing the party if I'm setting the tone if I'm you know, producing the experience, then everyone's needs will be celebrated and acknowledged and, and, and hopefully met. And we, we, I will create an environment that facilitates my best work and then just find collaborators who are happy to work in that way too. Yeah, totally. And then, and then I'm not going to spend unnecessary or waste energy trying to counter someone else's really fraught energy. Yeah, <laughs> it's just energy is a real thing and it's, you know, it affects me. And I'm with you on that. Good, great. Yeah, you gotta, I mean, <laughs> yeah. my biggest emancipation from my corporate hell was in an environment that I think was a, a very, uh, what's the word? It was very enabling for people to maintain negative vibration. Mm. You could complain and, you know, get very supported for being miserable in this space. Oh, I know. And people love to complain. I mean, I'm definitely on the complaining boat, you know, especially before I get my period, but, <laughs> but people love to complain and it, and it's something that I've, I've become very sensitive to because I, I just like, 
as, as I said earlier, when I'm socializing, I like to do it in a positive way. I like to give out good energy. I like to spread love. And, and to sometimes in a corporate world, in an office, it's like you just hear so many people complaining about their lives. And it's like, just do, you know, you... There's, sort it out. Yeah, no one's putting a gun to your head and telling you that you have to do this every day. And we all have the power to create our lives. And we're all in our lives because it's what we chose. And Also, if you, I think there's certain accountability for things like physical mess, but not enough accountability for things like energetic mess. Right. And if you are a fucking mess, yeah. then it's your responsibility to tidy up so that you can work well with other people. Yeah. And if you are <laughs> if you are not appropriate energetically to be in a shared space, then you need to call it. Yeah. And Go to meditation or something <laughs> and just figure it out. I mean, we've all been there. We've all been down in the dumps. You know, we've all had a breakup. We've all like whatever. But, you know, once you walk into those doors, it's not about that. It's not about that And anymore. this is a British colony. You cannot <laughs> fake it till you make it in a British colony that is oh stiff upper lip and not expressing of their emotions <laughs> in the slightest, then, then you've got a problem. It's so funny. Anyways. Um, <laughs> so I mean, that, so you, that's, that's a really interesting uh, story because if you went from a design education into an environment that allowed you to not only have a space in which you could observe and learn, but then also kind of level up in terms of what you were able to understand and you know run while you were doing that mm -hmm. at what point did the the small agency experience become not not right for you anymore um i just a year and a half in i just decided to move to berlin i kind of didn't i just wasn't really into sydney I just needed to get out, I finished school, I did everything I needed to do and I was like, I just need to get back to Europe and I want to be an artist. And so I decided to move to Berlin, I moved there for six months and it didn't work out for me. It was so big, you know, from coming from like, you know, even Madrid was just so like homey and you know, you walk down the same street every day and you know everyone. and. You know, I grew up in San Francisco and that was the same vibe. And then Sydney was definitely this feeling of comfort. And then Berlin was just this like scary hole and everyone's an artist. It's like going to LA and everyone's an actor. And I was just like, what am I doing? And I really um, gave it my all. I really did, but I just lost myself. It was too difficult. And so I decided to come back here. Do you think that that um, format of Berlin is difficult, but well, I think it's difficult because there's a lot of distraction and a lot of people who are living inexpensively and have a lot of yeah. time spare and idle hands doing the devil's work. Yeah. But do you think that there's something about with if everyone's special, no one's special? Like if everyone's totally. Artist, what are we observing? Oh my god! And it was so funny because I came from like an extreme advertising thing to like extreme like almost laziness around me, and I was like, what is this energy? Like, oh. <laughs> Interesting, because it's actually like the life. That if your if your peers and your physical space is one of like no one really having to be anywhere and sort of this, you know, and, I mean, there's a yeah. kind of bohemian utopia taking place at the moment in Berlin. Not going to last for long because it's kind of going to be New York in twenty totally. years time. But in the meantime, it's got yeah. this sweet spot where it's still just in the boundaries of affordable enough that you can kind of coast a bit. Yeah. Um, how long into well, how long into arriving in Berlin did you feel like you were in danger of losing your mojo? I think the so I went touring with the Multiculti guys because I did some work with them and um, we all kind of lived in a house together. It was me and two other guys and I didn't really have my space as a woman and I felt like I was always surrounded from around guys and stuff, which is fine because I, I like that normally, but I just felt like I just felt lost, kind of like I had no one who I could real who really got me. I felt like you know, I always felt like you know, kind of black sheep. Like, what am I doing here? I don't belong here, and and I think it also took me a while to um, get into the routine, into the rhythm of just making art every day. 
because I was trying to be an artist, you know, and then hustling and trying to find work and, and thinking about, you know, where am I going to get my next big paycheck from and what am I going to do and do I want to work in a cafe? No, I don't want to, like, you know, and it, it was a lot of worrying and I think when you are constantly thinking about money and, and your life and you're, you know, 25, you're kind of in this weird spot and you're like, what am I doing? And I was really fighting for it and I, I did a, I really gave it a good go and I was just kind of like, this isn't for me, you know? And especially mixing that with partying and that kind of thing, it's, it's, it's very destabilizing. Because I suppose you are in a whole new space physically and in terms of there's no one demanding anything of you the way mm -hmm. maybe you, the structure of home can allow yeah. for. So there's no, there's no structure unless that you, which you create yourself. Yeah. And if you're in an environment where the little tenuous links that you have towards structure are at the mercy of, yeah, like partying lifestyle and yeah. the lack of certainty to do with the job security or, you know, if your home doesn't feel like your own because you're just a tourist, yeah. there's not really any anchors to... There was no anchors and I just needed structure. I'm very good with structure. I'm very good when I'm working hard, when I'm busy, you know, when I feel like I'm being useful, when I feel like I have a voice, when I feel like I have a platform. And I've always had a voice and I've always had a platform, but no one was really noticing it. And I felt like, what am I doing this all for? And I, and I obviously, you know, was doing it and have been doing it my whole life because if not, then I don't think I could live because it's the, it's the, my, I breathe art, I breathe creation, I breathe my writing. And, and so, um, but it wasn't enough. It just wasn't enough because you need, you need your foundation, you need, you know, your anchors and, and you need to feel like, like you're someone in this world, not just someone living in your own head. Well, also, it's good to call that or to do enough work on yourself that you can take stock of what does matter to you. You mm -hmm. know, for some people, like throwing all the chips up in the air and seeing where they land by moving to Berlin and having no fixed address, sleeping once or twice a week, you know, yeah. just that, that wonderful, I mean, that my early 20s and mid 20s and possibly even late 20s <laughs> were completely <laughs> defined by a lack of structure. And I think, I'm sure I had, you know, the illusion of structure within that, but uh, I definitely, after a trial and error, realized, oh, you know what? Like, I don't really work well this way. Yeah. But I needed to do the, the enough uh, experimentation to work out how I totally. could like my, you know, what I was able to achieve. Yeah. Do you think that, um, you know, it does take a, a little bit of trial and error to kind of work out how you like your your lifestyle? Oh, if you don't try all the flavors of ice cream, you don't know what, you, you know, you don't know that you love cookies and cream, you know? So totally. And, and I'm definitely a stubborn lady. So I need to get my feet wet and everything and to like learn, put my hand in the fire and burn myself and fall off the bike. And, and it teaches me how to be humble and, and and how to be grateful for, for things. And when things do work, it's it's like this true happiness because I, I know that I really deserve it because I've really worked hard at getting there and tried everything. And when things aren't working, I know it's because I'm not trying everything. So it leaves you to live a really fulfilling life. If you, I mean, you sounded like you touched on another thing that you realized that matters to you, which is um, validation. You know, like mm -hmm. having the work be received. You know, if you were an actor, it's one you can't just do monologues in your room by yourself. No. You actually need the audience's feedback in order to for the work to be validated in your mind. And maybe was there some part of your experimentation that led you to need or rely upon or even just value the work being seen or totally. having some, some greater meaning beyond just yourself? I think like if you're locked in a box making the best artworks in the world or writing the best poems in the world and no one sees it ever, then what is that, you know? It, and that's why this space, this down under um, experimental art space that I'm running now is so important to me because it really is what I believe in, it, giving a voice to these young artists and making them feel like they are being heard because that's half the battle, you know, expressing yourself and, and telling your story through, through your, 
you know, pieces is, is really important, I think. I mean, that's what we all do in the end of the day, whether you're a doctor. I mean, imagine you're a doctor and you have no patients. Like, it doesn't make sense. So what, was, what are some of the works or the types of works that have been uh, finding a space at Down Under? Um, good question. Really diverse group of people. Um, tonight, for example, we're having a show with um, with young kids who are of all ethnicities um, and celebrating their voice because they don't feel like they have a voice here in Sydney. So kind of people from the, you know, Parramatta and what is that called? Eastern, is that Eastern Suburbs? Um, it's like, it's Western it Suburbs. Oh, Western Suburbs, sorry. Because, yeah, the, the, the East is water. So <laughs> yeah. the West, there's a lot I'm really very... bad, guys, <laughs> just so you know. Um, yeah, so like that area who like don't have a voice here in Sydney because they're so far further out. So kind of, you know, tapping into that. And then an art, the show that I curated before that was called Making Shapes Artists in Fashion. And it was celebrating how um, artists do live in the fashion industry, even though they have fashion jobs, so we celebrated that. Um, but yeah, just a good, good majority of different things. What makes, uh, you know, you, we see shows in galleries and at museums and uh, in, in spaces, and you know when you've seen a good show, you know when it's resonated. What are the qualities of, of a good show when someone's been well I think that it's when you think about the space in a 360 degree way, when you think about the, the music that comes along, the, 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 the description on the thing, the lighting is very important, um, and, and I think it's just the general energy, the people that, that you decide to get involved, like for me that's a huge thing. Um, maybe I'm not so crazy about the artwork, but that person I love and I just want them around and I want them to show their thing, but it's not, you know, necessarily my style. I don't really, you know, so for me, it's kind of more what's, I don't know, everything, not so much just the art. The art is kind of almost secondary for me, which is a really weird thing to say for now. I mean, I think it'll be different when I'm like two years into doing this. I might be more like, oh, but I think for now, it's just getting the energy down there right, you know? And the art's kind of like, you know, is that a weird, is no, that a no. weird response? Well, oftentimes, you know, <laughs> you, it's you, completely opposite. <laughs> but also, who's to say, you know, the art, the validity yeah. of the work is really up for grabs. Also, but actually, yeah. it's much more tangible to talk about the other elements. Also, like, just because I like something, who am I? You know, what makes that good? You know, you could like something completely different. There's no right or wrong, so it's kind of like thinking outside the box. What what can make this good, aside from the art? Does art move in trends? You know, like, if, if I'm, I'm very good at, I'm, I'm really good at seeing whether a fashion color palette is coming a mile away so that when it lands I'm like oh, I saw that last year that makes perfect sense to me does art move in similar ways where you can see trends I think so I mean even when I look at my past work I can be like that's from 2008 you know just because of the technique I was using which was like around at the time I mean I definitely think so um, yeah and does it respond to cycles the way that fashion does I was speaking to someone who's a, a fashion, uh, the editor of a few different fashion publications on the podcast recently, and I was saying, you know, but why is it a 20 year cycle with fashion? Is it because if you're influenced by something growing up, by the time you're the one dictating the style, you just revive what was hot when you right. were 15, by the time you're 35? You know, why is it a 20 year thing? Does fashion, does that art like fashion move in, in cycles in the same way, do you think? I mean, it's, it's kind of a broad question and I can't really speak for everyone because art is a totally different, I mean, no, art and fashion are obviously interconnected, but, but artwork is so much, I don't know, it's not like something someone's wearing really it's, there, there are more formats than yeah just the one it's idea. kind of so broad but um i don't know that's because, my answer <laughs> because also with, you know i would imagine that even politically or you know the, 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 the socio-politically all the things that people people want to see you know for example i also well i would imagine that these days people are really interested in diversity of mm -hmm. artists, you know yeah we're probably a little bit anti just 
a white middle class. Totally. But even the fashion industry is like that as well. You know, on the runway, people are making sure that they have Asian people, African people, Indian people. Bigger figure models. Yeah, Mm. uh, different ranges of sizes, not just that. And I think, it. you know, even with the way we're eating, we're just more aware. I think that generally there's a bigger awareness in the world for every kind of category that exists, which I kind of really feel good about because finally, you know, I mean, think about where we were 20 years ago. And also, if you were ever bored with the culture and you were to wonder why you're you know, not more excited, it's because you've been hearing one note be played mm. for the last hundred years. Yeah. And how wonderful that this kind of you know, range of colors is being uh, experienced through you know, all these different art forms that haven't previously listened to the voice of, you know, Black women, you know, or yeah, totally. Asian, Asian, young Asian girls, or you know, all these different um, voices that are starting to make their way through. Mm-hmm. Is there another um, show that you're on the lookout for for Down Under? Do you want video? Do you want spoken word? Do you we want... we do we do we have a video one coming up in a couple months. Just tons of projections all over. Um, I run a monthly reading event um, for a Saturday of every month with Oliver Mall, who's um, a writer here in Sydney, called Café Del Moi. So that's very exciting. That's happening this Saturday, and that's something I'd like to talk about. It's it's just such a different thing to do, you know, going to a reading. Yeah. It's such a different thing to do, and people freak out. They're like, I get people coming up to me like, "Thank you so much," and I'm like. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, uh, because audience members, or yeah, audience, mm. both, because it's it's so special um, being a part of something like that in the audience as an audience member, and as someone who's a part of it. And I started doing it with Oliver without any idea of what I was doing, and he was like, I had to host it, obviously, because who else is going to host it? And I didn't know, and I just went on the mic, and it's so funny and so fun because I never know what I'm going to say. I never know what I'm going to read until like an hour before, just because I have so much content that I can just... Things you've written yourself? Things I've written myself from my whole life that I just kind of go on stage. I'm like, this is from 2008, you know? And Or I'm like, I wrote this this morning, and it's like a story about me and my boyfriend like in a fight or something. And and it's just... Fuck yeah, you, yeah, Dave. Yeah, like, no. <laughs> No now and no forever. <laughs> um, yeah, with a microphone yelling at him with an audience, I told you. <laughs> Pick up your shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really cool because it's so personal and I love that and that's kind of why I love doing what I do is it's so personal and people, it's cutting all the bullshit that people have and it's just like, this is me, I'm raw, and everyone's raw and people feel like they can be that and they don't need the small talk and they don't need that because it's like we're just being ourselves and we don't need to try to be anything else. The simplicity of a, a real experience, a shared experience, which cuts through this, like what, what is like the illusion of social media, the idea that you can actually take away all of the layers, mm-hmm. the digital layers, and just experience someone's ideas in a blank room totally with a microphone if that yeah and how deeply engaging and personal and connective and real it can be and i tell you if you were to do something like that don't those ideas just linger with you for days you know you go along to see a a, a poetry reading or someone sharing ideas in a really streamlined space like that for some reason it lands and resonates in a way that the other forms of intake don't and maybe it's because all the middle elements have been cut out and you're just getting straight to the marrow of sharing human experience totally and it's why people you know watch a film or read a book or something because they're almost like searching for like some kind of human experience or like to not feel alone or whatever and it's like this is before that this is before the scripts made this is before the books written it's like just our thoughts and we're not thinking too much and and so it's really nice and and that's kind of you know what i like to do with my art and you know I, i'm trying to release this book um where it's kind of just all my writings well not all of it but just kind of a collection of different things that i've written since i was a little kid 
in this kind of four part series um, um, where you can just kind of get to the grid of it and see what's in my mind and then you can read and be like, oh, that's exactly how I feel. I'm not such a weirdo, you know, it's okay. Um, cool. <laughs> have you thought about what drives you? Is it the notion of, is, are there any through lines through all the different formats that you work in to tell a key story? I think the key story is my story because it's the only story I really have and that I know so well because like, you know, we're going to die, which is crazy. Like it always spins in my mind how we're not like eternal beings and <laughs> like, whoa. Um, so it's kind of like I just want to give it my all and I want to do it in a way that it affects people positively and because, you know, a lot of people are like in their heads and they don't really like get the feeling that this is it. And so if I can even spread that kind of feeling through what I do to anyone um, where they feel like, oh yeah, this is it, I can do it. I, I'm not alone, everyone's together, we can all hold hands and jump across the bridge without dying, like across to the other side. Um, <laughs> um, then that's kind of enough for me, that's really it for me. It's just kind of spreading that, making an artwork and, and having it in someone's house and giving them joy through that, you know, um, whether there's an inspirational sign on that piece, which is kind of frequent in my work. Um, it's just like spreading the love and the feeling that, you know, we're together. What, if someone were to be selling you, if your agent would be saying, oh, Carla Uyarte, she <laughs> <Ooh>. is <laughs> so multi-talented, she's multidisciplinary, she works across X. What would your agent sell you as being someone who is as fluent, who's, who is ex experimental, expressive in which formats? Yeah, this is a really interesting question um, because I'm really bad at answering it because I just, I can't just do one format ever. Um, like in an average day, I'll just break it down for you. I can wake up in the morning and I have everything on airplane mode and I just need to paint for a couple hours and and within the painting while I'm painting I'm thinking right and so within that I just need to write so then like in the middle of my painting like I write something down and then I'm like painting and then I'm writing so it's like doing this double thing and then maybe like I'm thinking of a next title for a painting which inspires me to do so then at this like whole table will be filled with like 50 things and and then I'm like okay now what? And maybe I go outside and I just feel like doing recording videos to just create like a library of videos so that when I'm doing like live visual DJing I have like interesting video content or maybe I'm working on a music video and it's part of that and then I want to do animation on top. So it's that, if that makes sense. It's kind of all those things. That's a really... Oh, oh. thank you. <laughs> Lights <That's>... off. <laughs> Oh, done. It's a really great technique to be in the middle of something and then to allow yourself to just do the other thing until that um, expression is satisfied and then you then by that stage you're ready to come back to this thing right. until at which point you know that oh as a matter of fact this, there's a third thing I want to bring in because you almost trick yourself in it's like the opposite of what I've just described is sitting down in front of your desk oh my to gosh. make work and if that's a terrifying concept you can dupe yourself out of it by riding waves of inspiration to different things you haven't even got time to censor yourself mm. because you're just vomiting forth yeah. ideas and if you get caught in a loop it's almost like riding waves for surfers I imagine you can just move from one force of totally you know, move, like one force of movement to another so effortlessly that you haven't even got time to let your inner sensor go is it the right choice of word am i using the right you know paintbrush i never feel that i never doubt myself when i'm creating for some reason like i'm really lucky with that i just really trust my instinct and i'm just like this is what you're doing it's like i have someone inside me like doing it all for me and it just feels really good and a perfect day would just be that, you know, like everything. And then maybe like some exercise, you know, <laughs> and some sex, but like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, I just, I can really hang out alone. I'm really good at it. So yeah, that's kind of it. Do you want to give me, just cause I'm interested for my own awareness around timeline, what it was that took you from post Berlin to 
curating a gallery space? Oh, yeah, sure. So I moved back to Sydney and as you can imagine, I was like, what the hell is up with this rent thing? It's ridiculous. And I was like, I am not going to get some crappy job and everything that I just did was for nothing. I'm going to fight for doing what I want to do. And so I moved in with my sister for a bit, then I moved in with my mom for a bit, and all the money that I was making from freelancing, I, I kind of started to build my own client base. And what skills were you selling as a freelancer at that time? Design. I'm a designer, which is what I learned in school, thank God. And I'm, I'm, I, it's really fun. I love doing design because I always mix it with a creative thing. You know, I always use paint or use this or, or tons of things layered on top of each other and I love doing it. So it's like I'm making really good money while being passionate about what I'm doing. So, you know, design, branding, that kind of thing was, was a lot of the work. I had a couple big music video stuff. I did some textiles for a sneaky sound system, music video for them. So kind of just had these like really cool projects and I never, like it never ended. And that's the thing about Sydney, is it's so easy here. Well, for me, it felt so easy. I was like, okay, and then after that project was this project, and then someone contacts me from Instagram and wants me to do this, and then that, and that, and it just was like, I'm making money. And so I rented a studio space in, um, in Alexandria, which was great, 75 bucks a week, really easy. And then I started, I mean, that's, yeah. That's Saying, that's a very unusual was, gift. Yeah. I mean, generally, I do believe that if you're in a good state of flow, the universe will assist you with certain things like that. But for many people listening, they're like seventy-five dollars a week. Like, that's, that's amazing. Oh yeah, it was yeah, which was crazy. So I was like, perfect. So I had my own workspace and I had my own place, even though I was like living with my mom. <laughs> And it just, I was just great. And then, um, and let's face it, seventy-five dollars a week is a night on the piss, basically. Oh, yeah. Like, you can definitely find even $100 a week yeah. by just streamlining other expenses to invest in your own creative process if it means living somewhere that's not so big so that then you can have enough money to buy a studio. Yeah. It's a worthwhile investment. It really is, and it's all about, like, sacrifice. And, and sometimes, like, you just got to start over and you got to sacrifice and you got to bite the bullet and just keep moving forward. Well, that gets us on to the, an, an interesting point because most people do find it really difficult to buy themselves the time to be an, ex an artist or to be a creative person because they don't necessarily feel, well I mean the whole purpose of this podcast is for people who feel like frustrated creatives but it sounds to me like you were never really that frustrated a creative because you've always been able to find a day job that is at least satisfactory in terms of giving you some creative expression. You did, sounds like you didn't ever have a period of- No, you're of wrong. Not being able to do I the I mean, thing. when I was living in Madrid from 18 to 22, I was a very frustrated creative because I, and even after that, even, I think I've always been a frustrated creative until now because I always was like, when is this going to be smooth? When am I going to, you know, when can I just do this? And, and I think like that whole period of like figuring it out is a, is a lot of frustration, you know, even though you're creating, as we talked about earlier, when it, when you feel like it's not, it's not being seen or your voice isn't being heard or things just aren't flowing or you're not passionate about the work you're doing, you know, whether it's serving coffees or working in front of house for something or, you know, or just painting and that not going anywhere. Like that's really frustrating. And only now do I kind of feel like things are finally, you know, falling into place because of all the hard work I've done previously. How old are you now? 27. That ain't bad. Some um. people really spend, <laughs> well, some people, I mean, I don't think I was remotely, I'm, I'm 35 and I'd say that this feeling of, yes, I, I like where I'm going. I believe in my, the path is allowing me to be of service and do things that I believe in. You know, that's only come about in the last year, maybe two. Okay. You know, like it's, it's been a long road to actually get into a place where I don't feel like a frustrated creative, which is now why I'm making a podcast to right. help liberate people who are in that place. Because that journey began for me like just post high school. And if it took me, let's say, what, 15 years to get to a place that I was actually 
not frustrated. Yeah, <laughs> That's a long time. They don't make it easy for us. And when I say they, I mean like the entire society and world because, you know, as you said earlier about your parents thinking about what your best, you know, the way that you can make money from being creative, what that would be advertising. It's like, no, like there's other ways. And, and luckily, I think in this day and age with the internet and all of those things, it's kind of feels more feasible to be your own boss and to do your own thing. And there are these new roles that you never even knew existed that are kind of popping up out of nowhere. And people kind of feel like more independent and like, I can do this. I think that's happening now versus like 10 years ago. 1000%. Even just the idea that someone, well, what I think people should be, I, I'm going to go and give a speech at my old high school on a careers night. Oh, cool. And I looked at the list of other people <laughs> who, were, who were talking on the night and they're like, engineer, marine biologist, rocket scientist. Yeah. I'm going to be the only creative person who's like, all right guys, anyone who's creative, it's okay. Yeah. You can do this. You just got to be self-sufficient. You've got to get yourself a skill that you can sell as a creative so that you can learn in the in a creative industry. It doesn't matter if it's the one you end up on. You know, there are so many things that you can do, but I come from a school that produced nothing but lawyers and right. accountants mm -hmm. so there is very little concern for how to have a creative life that allows you to have an income and be your own boss and understand what it's even it's even like to think entrepreneurially in, right in that space i mean where's that education for teenagers there is no manual and it's like that doesn't even exist and and a, and a lot of like you know the teachers or you know people in your family are like what are you doing with your life and they still like i don't even know if they still get like my do my parents get what i'm doing i don't know you know i think they th still think that i'm like a struggling artist so it's kind of like you're kind of going against the what is it the grain. The grain. <laughs> yeah, you're going against the grain, but it's definitely worth it because you were kind of born to do that, you know? And as creatives, like your head is kind of made differently, you know? It's not just like you need to study for 10 years and become a lawyer. It's like you need to live life for 10 years and then you can, you know, land there. And also to be a highly specialized lawyer, doctor, what have you, you do study for 10 years. So why as a creative do we think that we don't need to study not necessarily within an institution but on ourselves the school of life within our own processes in, in terms of being a multidisciplinary creative who's able to pick up a video camera put it put it through final cut mm -hmm. you know edit through after effects write the scripts that support that work stage the events that put the work on you know those techniques and processes take so much time to develop but you better believe that it's the work of years. Totally. And and also like you can just go on YouTube nowadays and learn anything on there and it's really amazing, let me tell you. Like it's just yeah, so YouTube University. YouTube University <laughs> is where I went, guys. Like <laughs> I learned so much stuff and I still do every day. Just like type in what you want to learn and then tutorial and you're good to go and you have a new skill, you know? I love that. Uh, yeah. If, if anyone, I mean, uh, I, I do love to check in with people and say to them as I'm, you know, seeing them off, if I bump into you in a year's time, is there one project that you would love to have completed or satisfactorily nailed to say, yes, I've done it, I've done that thing, what would that be? Definitely. Um, so the book that I was talking about earlier, originally I wanted it to be like a coffee table book, but maybe I'll wait later till later on in my life for the coffee table book. I want to do a couple more things before that shiny thing comes out. But I definitely want to do this four part book that I was referring to because I have everything ready. It's just the whole publishing blah, blah, blah part that kind of like, ugh. Um, but yeah, that would be my thing. Are you old school in that it wouldn't satisfactorily be an e-book? It would need to be an actual oh, physical book? Oh, yeah. It's going to be a nice, beautiful, maybe B5, you know, a little smaller than A4 kind of thing in a nice plastic case and packaging impeccable kind of vibe. So that's, you know, kind of where I'm at now. But yeah, so in a year's time, if I don't have that done, you can just knock some sense into me, like slap my face and be like, Carla. Not in Basque country. Anymore. I know, I, I, like my ancestors do. 
My forefathers did. They said it with the back of their hand. They just... Uh, I, Violence. I, I, I just want you to know, you've been in a number of different work environments and you, you yourself have been that frustrated creative. You've no doubt surrounded yourself at various stages with varying levels of frustrated creative. What would you say to someone who's listening to this who is stifled and just doesn't know where to begin? They're like, well, how do you even know how to paint and how to write and how to do the things? You know, clearly you didn't go to study at a university for each and every one of the formats that you do. How does someone get more fluid in, within their own practice? So A, if, figure out what you're passionate about because that's going to guide you through everything. And when you say that, because I think that that's important, but some people would answer that, well, how do I know? Well, you got to try stuff out. What, what are you fascinated with? What do you like? Do you, you know, are you interested in art? Do you, do you always see yourself as someone like doodling in a cafe? Become that person. You got to uh, visualize who you want to be in the future and you have to know before you can do anything. Like, who are you? I think that we need to learn how to read our own manuals as human beings and learn how to work ourselves, our machinery, and know what's happening inside and figure that out and then once that's figured out then think about what you like like what do you how do you want to spend your time what does your perfect day consist of and then once you figure that out just do it every day every day you know wake up one hour earlier and write for an hour you know or draw for an hour or run for an hour if you want to do a marathon you know like there is enough time in the day and i think sometimes people fall into this idea of laziness and they're tired, but you're not, you know? Come on, people used to like be in the medieval ages. They were tired. Like we're pretty good. <laughs> we can do it. Yeah, we can do it. We have like, uh, we have it pretty good at 2018, like, and yeah. You might be compromising TV time at night, but you know, that's probably okay. Oh, come on, mm. please. <laughs> it's nothing good. There's nothing good going on. And no, I'm just kidding. TV's great, but. Yeah, go into the TV of your mind. <laughs> it's a whole lot better than Yeah, Netflix. change those channels. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much. I feel like it's wonderful to speak to someone who's just doing it, you know? I don't think you, that's, from the sound of things, you don't let any sort of sensor hold you back from expression. Oh, and, thanks for having me. You're such a pleasure to talk to. <laughs> That's what I do. Oh my I god, so charming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Thank you, bye. bye.